Hey, hope you're having a good Tuesday. Thank you for joining me for today's Five for Five. Uh, I got a question for you to get started. Uh, same question that my high school English teacher gave to our class one day. The class question was, what is the opposite of love? This question stuck with me because all of us got the wrong answer. Every one of us wanted to say, well, of course, the opposite of love would be hatred. Uh, we all thought for sure that that emotion, that, that strong feeling of hatred would, of course, be the opposite of love. She told us we were wrong. Well, we thought of other things. We thought, well, maybe she's thinking of vengeance or someone who would vindicate themselves, someone who would maybe speak ill of other people, just going with the opposites of love, trying to figure out what she was looking for as we couldn't figure out what is the opposite of love that she's, she's thinking of. Well, she explained she believed that the opposite of love would be apathy. Because when it comes down to it, love is one of the strongest emotions, probably the strongest emotion we can have positively for anyone else. But hatred is still an emotion. It's still a feeling that we can have towards someone else. And it takes a relationship to even hate someone. It, it, they may be your enemy, uh, but it takes a relationship. She said the opposite of love would be apathy because apathy means that you really do not care. It's the complete lack of care or concern for someone else. All this week, we're talking about spiritual apathy and how as believers, if we're not careful, we can easily slip into this place of spiritual apathy, the place where we really just live as if we don't care about Jesus Christ or about his kingdom, about his church, or about the ways of, of his kingdom and the way he wants us to live it out. So today, as we look at spiritual apathy, I want to challenge you with, with a verse from 2 Peter. It's one of my favorite passages. It begins with the verse where it says that his divine power, God's divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, or his own glory and goodness, as some translations put it. And I love these verses because it tells us from the very beginning that God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. I've shared these verses in five for fives. I've preached through this. And I love how the Peter in this letter, as he goes on to talk about the great promises that we have in Jesus Christ and the great, the great way that he's given us the, the ability and the power now in his spirit to live for him. He, he lists the virtues and the things that we're to live out. He says, for this very reason in verse five, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue, with knowledge and knowledge, with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. So it sounds great to this point, but the warning comes in the next few verses because Peter says there is an alternate to this, even for the believer, some different way that we may try to live. Because he says it this way, if these qualities are yours and ever increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. It gives a picture of two different believers. Believers, not just the lost and the, the saved, but two different believers, two different people who have tasted and experienced the great grace of Jesus Christ. And one is one who is living in the faith and following after Jesus Christ and seeking to add to their faith the virtues and the knowledge and the self-control and ultimately the great love that he has called us to live out. That's one picture of the believer. He said the other believer is nearsighted and has so much as forgotten the great grace that he has experienced. When we live in a place of spiritual apathy, that's exactly what we're becoming. It's like we're becoming blind to the grace and the goodness of God that he has so richly poured out on us. And there's things that we need to do. There's, there's focuses that we need to have. And as we come together in church, as we spend time in God's word, as we get connected with other people in the community of faith, as we are challenged by the life that we're living and challenged to the life that God calls us to live for him, as we look at all these ways, they're all a challenge to that, that opportunity of becoming apathetic in our faith. And rather than becoming apathetic, God calls us to become effective in our faith, effective in living out the life that he's called us to live for him. So all this week, tune in with us as we look at what spiritual apathy looks like. And I challenge you to go into God's word and look and see what he would have you to do to become one who is just loving him more and more each and every day. And as you love him, pursuing him and following in his ways. Hope you have a great day today.